Hello and welcome to today's episode of Brand Disruptors. I am Mia Lamott, your host. And today I am here with Natalie Davison. And we're going to be talking about all things social media, but also we're going to be talking about those flamingos in the background. So <laughs> welcome, strap in, and let's get started. Tell them hello, Natalie, and let them know a little bit about you. Hey everybody, I'm Natalie Davison. I'm located in Atlantic Canada and from here I run Miro Marketing. So Miro Marketing is um, was an agency that has transitioned fully into a marketing communications teaching company. So we teach marketing communications to brands and um, that's how we spend our days and it's a lot of fun. I imagine like right now, marketing communication is something that's really big, right? Especially online, because people just need to get the message out, right? Oh yeah, it's, um, I just actually, before we came on here, I just had an email from somebody and they, they were like, okay, in the times of COVID, because if you're watching this in the future, we're still in the times of COVID. Um, in the times of COVID, what do we do about, and then, you know, a page long list of all of the items that they're worried about, right? So yeah, marketing communications, brand communications are really essential right now. But I think what's interesting is, I think everybody's assumed that things have changed drastically when really, they haven't it's just we have a bit more of a requirement to lean more into the honest truth of who we are maybe more than ever oh my god so i'm not gonna even ask you these questions right now because i am so intrigued by what you said i just did a live on the same thing right oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah because don't you think that COVID has kind of had us take a step back and actually look at what's really important i mean Yes, absolutely. I also think that uh, COVID slash political divide slash everything that's kind of happening in the world right now has really divided us in a way that I haven't experienced in my lifetime. So I've never seen division quite this intense before. Um, and, you know, what I feel that's left very little tolerance for is the gray area. So I don't feel from what I can observe and what's happening online and seeing what's effective and what's not, you can't water yourself down right now and keep a toe in every puddle to try and appease everybody. Like, you know, we always said, oh, great brands attract and repel. Yes, but that has never <laughs> meant more than it does today because if you're not repelling somebody as people are repelled so easily right now, if your brand is not repelling anybody, it is definitely not attracting anybody. You have watered things down and you were just kind of like flying under the radar and nobody can see you, you know? Exactly. Oh my God, I love all of that. Okay, so she remember guys, she said that she's from Canada. And she can still tell the political divide. And I know she's kind of talking about what's happening here in America. Uh, and yeah, yeah, for sure. It, like, I mean, you know, we're, we're glued to your debates, let me tell you. You know, <laughs> what happens in America majorly affects what happens in Canada. But make no mistake, whether, you know, you, you are our influencer. You are. American politics influence Canadian politics. American policy influences Canadian. It's, it's just, I want to say, you know, that, that that doesn't happen and that we, but it does. I mean, we're such close neighbors. Our economies are so wildly intertwined and you have such a larger economy and population base than we do. So it's really important to Canadians what's happening in the U.S. But also, we just had a provincial election here in, in my province of New Brunswick during COVID. So we had the first election in Canada that happened during COVID and we were more divided than ever. I mean, when you look at the lines of division in our province and the way that, that um, votes fell, we were more divided than we were two years ago when we went to the polls. And so I see people divided on small matters. Masks are political. Whether you may wear a mask or not, is a political statement to some people. So yeah. we've politicized almost anything. So whether it's the U.S. election or, you know, whether you recycle your trash, I mean, all of these things now are soapboxes that people are dividing and uniting over. Yeah, I, I love that you spoke to the recycling piece because I think that, and especially with all of the issues that we're all having, right? 
So it's almost like there's one party or one, one side of, you know, we get to do what we want to do and what we've been doing. And like, that's what it means to be free. But then there's another side of us that are like, hey, we need to look at how things are being destroyed and things are, things are not really aligned with, you know, the values that we say, right, that we say are important to us. So tell me a little bit about like, how do you guys decide like who you're going to work with? Oh yeah. Okay. So I, I, I'm loving that question, but I have to go back to something you said, because yes. you said um, about people who are like, oh, the way we were living was being free. And I think you really nailed something that I have not thought about until this moment. And that is really, we all do want freedom. We all do want to be free. That is the goal, but it's like people are defining freedom in these very polarized ways absolutely it's like this idea that you know we were free when we weren't and, and it's, it's this understanding of like what is the truth of the freedom like like were we free or were we not like it anyway that's really the interesting thing because so often we all want the big picture same thing and all of this disagreement this and this um angst comes from our disagreement on how to get there and who yeah. should get there? Well, I think it has to do with what people actually believe or what people have been exposed to. Because mm -hmm. I was talking to um, he who shall not be named supporter, and they were <laughs> asking me about, <laughs> they were, I, I asked them, I'm like, how do you even, like, I don't even understand. How do you support this? And they're like, well, do you watch the news? And I'm like, actually, I do. And I do my research and I do make sure that. I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like the scientific part of all of this. This is one of the other effects of COVID, especially here in America. Like scientific facts are also now being questioned. Because you talked about the whole mask thing and you talked about, you know, people making that political. Like I have some friends who are like super healthy who are like, I'm not wearing a mask. Like I don't have any problems. I'm not going to wear a mask. And I'm like, yeah, but does that help the other person who might not be as healthy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, the divide is all about, I think it's that, right, with the whole scientific thing, but it's also about self-preservation. And yes. it's mentality. It's like, I can't live in my freedom if you get it too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the freedom was totally false. And I think that us not, you, you mentioned recycling, us not really thinking about, you know what, we can keep destroying the earth, but if we keep doing that, then guess what? None of us will be here. It's so amazing because I just think everything we're seeing right now, you know, it's like we've taken these issues that we knew were here last year and we have really put them in a pressure cooker now and everybody is being forced to face them. So I think there were some of us that maybe we're facing them sooner and we're, you know, trying to do what we could sooner. And there are, but now nobody can escape it. And what you're really getting this interesting lens on is how far humans will go to defend their, their own existing beliefs and how hard it is to change your perception that is so difficult for people. So they would rather believe that scientists and politicians and every institution has been is lying about COVID, then face the possible very scary fact that this is all true. And that's really something to think about what the human mind can do and can convince us of. And it's really hard too when you have a president that's out, you know, stomping the grounds now doing campaign uh, on the campaign trail and he can infect people right now, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I know they said that he's not contagious, but do we really know? And why do we have different rules for him? Like COVID doesn't have different rules. For well, him. I mean, he got the, the best treatment that, you know, money could buy. So yeah. anyway, yeah, yeah. So it's, yes. a, it's a huge topic. And I'm so glad that you brought all that up because I think it does speak into like the brand, the marketing mm. and how, and how we actually show up in the world. Right. Cause yes. you're right. You can't have your toe in everybody's little pile. Like you got to find your lane and stick to that lane. Right. You, you can't. And I think people think you can. People assume that you can. And I mean, sure, you can try. But what will happen inevitably is you're going to waste a lot of time 
on the wrong things and we want the wrong people and a lot of money. And I mean, you know, we experienced in the early days of our business, um, we started as a marketing agency and we certainly didn't, we hadn't yet produced enough content to really let the world see who we were. And so we were just starting out and we picked up um, one of our first clients and it was a big client. It was a, it was such a big client. It was a celebrating big client. And that, person that ran that account ended up absolutely like not only being wrong for us but like really not liking us like not respecting us not thinking we should have a voice at the table as experts even though they hired us to have voice as voice at the table as experts and it became clear really really fast that we needed to make our content more clear make our content more obvious who are we for and that that required us to then be much more honest with ourselves about who we were. But you asked a minute ago, who do we work with or how do we decide? Um, what we really try to do is decide who we provide value to mm -hmm. and then show up so fully as ourselves because we've already determined who we as ourselves provide value to. And so now we show up over and over and over as ourselves. And usually that weeds out the people that are wrong for us. Absolutely. That sends them running the other way, <laughs> which is really helpful because when we do sometimes get to a proposal stage um, with somebody who is the wrong client for us, then we have to find ways to get, to get that relationship not to proceed because we never want someone to get into a contract with us and figure out who we are after the paperwork is signed after the dollars are exchanged yeah mm. yeah Ugh. yeah so maybe now we can get into some of these like what would you yeah. say what would you say your mantra is not only and it could be the same thing because they would be for me but what's the mantra for you and your business our most honest energy attracts our best lives oh love that that's so good. Like yes. I, I say, like I say, because I knew you're gonna ask me mantra, and I wrote it. But I need to start saying that every day. <laughs> I just need I know, to remind, we have to remind ourselves too, right? Yes. I'm gonna put it on my wall. <laughs> yes, we get to remind ourselves. Too. Yes. Yes, because yes. every day I'm like, okay, what am I gonna disrupt today? Like, how am I gonna upset <sighs> my status quo, the status quo that's out there? And I had to challenge myself on that too. So I'm glad that. You know, like, and that's what I want the listeners to understand. It's like, guys, you don't do this in a vacuum and it's not going to always be perfect, right? No, <laughs> it is like what I do for a living. And it is so, my existential crisis today was like, how do I get the hard words out of my soul and into the internet? Like, it, like I do this for a living and I still struggle with that. And I have a very supportive business partner who is like always there, always pushing me to be more myself thank thank god you know but um i'm not doing this alone and it's still so hard so when i say it like it's no big deal oh my most honest energy i mean we are trained to hide our most honest energy like we are we live in a system that's gonna say like what are you doing with flamingos in the background that's unprofessional like we have all of this you know, there was a time I wouldn't have worn black nail polish, like, because it was unprofessional. I mean, the things in my brain about how I was supposed to show up, it, it's a lot. <laughs> it is. And I'm so glad you talked about that, too, because I think we all had somebody's version of how we are supposed to show up, right? We've been living out of other people's context for forever. Uh -huh. And I think the world is waking up to that. And we're just uh -huh. like, you know what? no damn more like no we're over more. you know i'm so i'm 40 and i'm just so in tune with the years after you know we, we call it university you guys call it college um but the years after university my early career years where i worked in big corporate and really really wanted like very motivated i knew i could get promotions and all the things and check all the boxes and i, I knew i could and if, I believe I can do pretty much anything. So I, I was very clear on that. But the rules of that world all hinged, like my success, no matter what, 100%, 100% always hinged on my ability to make rich, straight, old, white men comfortable. And the more comfortable they felt, 
the higher the reward for my career. That was like my value was measured in the amount of comfort I delivered to that demographic. Yeah. And like that's, you know, and that's, I was being a good girl like I was told to, and it was working out well until I realized how small I had to make myself. Oh, you just said a mouthful. Like, mm -hmm. and I don't know that, I don't know a lot of people are even conscious to that right now, right? That we have made ourselves small. Women, especially women of color, even more. Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost like it's dangerous to be you because you won't get promoted. You're already not getting paid what everybody else is getting paid. It's so dangerous. you won't get the promotion. You can't wear what the hell you want to wear because you might get raped. You can't dance the way you want to dance because it might seem sexual. Like, it's such bullshit. And to your point, like, I, I, uh, my career started off in politics and not really politics, but I worked for elected officials and I had to play their damn game, right? So yeah. there's a lot of maneuvering, a lot of eating your words, there's a lot of not even telling the truth about what you think is right or wrong, you know? So I that's can that. so that is so true, and I can remember some of my jobs, well, all of my jobs, where one of the things that I thought was a great skill, <laughs> I can't even believe I'm saying this, but I thought it was a great skill that I was able to figure out what would uh, be the decision that my boss would want, and then I could actually suspend my own judgment, thoughts, and feelings to assume that. And so I was like, ooh, how valuable is this? I can always pick the thing that he wants me to pick and never have to, you know, use my silly girlish ways um, and, and rely on my own intuition gifts or whatever, right? The, those pesky things aren't going to get in the way. It's just really something when you think about um, how we were raised and how this world has rewarded success and how wildly that is currently being disrupted and how lucky we are. I know, like I was, I don't know who I was talking to, but I was like, you know what, what's happening right now in the world, you know, I can get pissed off about, but I'm like, this is actually a really great time to be alive because, you know, I've seen, like we've seen, I'm 10 years older than you, but I've seen like, the world actually change in front of our eyes and the fact that people are waking up to who they are mm. like that to me is the ultimate goal of being alive mm -hmm. right my parents didn't get to do that no that's you right know, they didn't get to do that because they had to figure out a way to send us to school and do all the things so i'm super grateful that i live in the world right now and i'm able to to sit here from a place, I recognize a place of privilege and say these things, right? Yes, yes, exactly. So, oh my gosh, like, you know, I recognize my privilege in this as well, obviously, as a white woman, and at the same time feel a massive responsibility to be as visible as possible so that I can make my friends as visible as possible and my clients and just, like, you know, my biggest dream on this planet is just to redistribute power, wealth, and influence. Like, that is all I think about all the time. And, you know, I did this exercise last night. It's so strange that we're talking about this today. I haven't even, we haven't shared this with any of our clients or anything. I just read it. Let's do it. Kira today. But um, I've always, like, there's this problem-solving model, the five whys, or you have a problem, and you're like, why did that happen? And then you ask why again, and then eventually you hopefully get to the root of the problem. Well, I decided to do that on my brand last night. So, so interesting. We're like, we're talking about this right now um, because, you know, you and I are in, uh, we're in a coaching group together, working on brand. Brand is all I do. We're launching a new program next month. And I just, our brand is like, we're so happy with it, but there's always layers. And I think that is one of the things that I, I wish everybody understood is like, your brand is never done. It's never. always going on and it's like the deeper you can get the better it's gonna be right so so this is some brand work we were doing so you know uh why do we do the work we do so our program is the society of brand integrity we teach marketing and we help and coach and keep entrepreneurs on brand because 
they'll build a beautiful brand and then a shiny object will come by and they'll forget about it. So we keep them on brand. We keep reminding them who they are and that's, that's our program. So why do we do it? So this is, this is what I wrote. Um, so to teach entrepreneurs how to use their voices. Why? Because I'm tired of seeing the same types of voices having all the power. Mm. Why? Because when marginalized voices try to speak in this world, we often can't hear them through the noise of us being busy trying to fit in. Mm. Why? <laughs> because if we're not listening to those voices, then we're now co-creating a world that benefits very few and oppresses many, including ourselves. Why? <laughs> we will always regret not using the platform we built to redistribute wealth, power, and influence. We will always regret just using your attention to sell you shit. Hmm. And that is the exercise, so highly recommend, <laughs> like it's not an official exercise. <laughs> Um, but highly recommend because it gave me a new level of depth in why we do what we do, you know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I love this, the, especially the last part, right? Um, because that was the core and the essence of who you guys are and why you are here. And you don't like, and you get to that by doing all of the other stuff, right? You yeah. got to that because of what's happening in the world, what, yeah. what you've been through, like, this is the new, this is what's going on. Yeah. And I love that you said your brand, like creating your brand never ends. Like, it's almost like us. Like, as long as you're evolving as a human being, your brand should be evolving. Yes. Right? Yes. It's yeah. like, yeah. And, and this does not mean endless rebrands. I think that, um, <laughs> I think that people <laughs> tweaks. <laughs> people are constantly rebrand oh we're getting a new name coming we're getting a new logo coming i'm like that is not the point <laughs> you know lots of agencies make a lot of money over that but that's um i'm so sorry about my dog that's oh, super no, on that he's that he's barking um, yeah <laughs> but but these constant rebrands and this constant you know new assets and all of this stuff um that is stays often so surface level would just be so much better if we could actually understand that the growth of a brand comes from the depth of its roots and not just adding more leaves all the time, you know? Absolutely. Okay. So I guess you've described your brand for us. <laughs> um, tell me like, what is your least favorite mode of communication? And don't tell, uh, don't tell me social media. <laughs> voicemail. I don't even understand the point of voicemail. Also I'm on box. Um, I'm on the not liking boxer train as well. Cause I think it's just voicemail in disguise. Basically. Um, <laughs> but like but you got to answer it right away. I don't get it. I don't get, I don't get why anybody leaves voicemail anymore. I don't get boxer. I do love a voice text. But I don't think we need a new channel. It's not the, the communicating by recorded voice that's my problem. It's the multiple boxes of places hiding I information. Oh, that actually makes sense because I was thinking, I like voicemail because I like to tell people why I'm calling. Mm -hmm. I don't like when people call and don't tell me why they're calling me. Fair. Especially fair. If I don't know, right? Yeah. But a voice message would do the same thing. Oh, I love a good voice text. And it's just like in the place where you receive information, right? So, you know, communication, the communication process has never changed. There's, um, you know, somebody sends a message out and they, they encode that message. And then there's a receiver and they decode that message. And it's like the smoother that path, the better the communication. But as soon as we start adding all of these like inboxes and mailboxes and all of these things, that path gets really confused, right? Yeah. So like, voicemail yeah. drives me bananas just because of that. Yeah, email yeah. for me is like that. <laughs> there you go. You know, send me an email so I can answer a question so you can come back and like, <laughs> Send the girl a voicemail. <laughs> right. I'm gonna have to try that. I'm gonna have to try that. <laughs> I did do some video messages last week and I really, really like that. Yes. So I'll be sending people responses that way. Mm, I love when people send me a video message. It makes my yeah. day. In fact, I got a podcast request today to be on an interview from somebody I'd never heard of. Just a cold email. It was very strange. And I was like immediately like, scam. 
And there was a video and I watched it and I really liked him. He, his, his personality was really engaging. So then I went and researched him. It looks like he's legit. So I was like, if he hadn't put that video in, there's no way I would have said yes to the podcast. Yeah, because I've gotten a couple too and it hadn't been, there was no video. And I haven't even responded to him. Yeah, exactly. And I booked, I have a call booked with him on Monday. <laughs> it's like, cool. so I know, so video, yeah, video is something else. That's super it's a cool. whole other All level. Right. So tell me what outfit makes you feel like a total badass? Uh, I, okay, I love showing up in the world like I am performing at some, like, even if it's just like going to dinner. So I went to an anniversary dinner with my husband the other night in leopard pants, right? Yes. In like small town New Brunswick, you know? Um, so like pleather pants, leopard print, everything, um, fur, but only vintage. Um, I have, I wear, I have a full fur coat that was, you know, well, from the eighties. Like yeah. I just, I love it. I love, I just love being completely over the top and just making a statement that like, if I can show up in the world like this, you can show up in the world however you want to. Like, I, I love that statement. I love that. I love that. So what would you not wear? Oh. Oh, I'm having a hard time with that one. I mean, like, you know, anything's like stained and like old, but like I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I wear pretty much anything. I wore pleather pants in high school. In fact, I was telling my business partner this the other day, I had this very prestigious co-op ed placement in grade 12. I was the first student ever, and I might have been the only student that ever got placed with a provincial court judge. And so it was a pretty big deal. I had very good grades and I had a really, you know, pretty good reputation and so this judge said okay you know Natalie come on in and so I, I went and bought myself a whole wardrobe and I showed up on my first day with a floor like leopard skirt to work with the judge like I I've always been this way and I uh, don't know where it came from but I love it I am here for it and back in the day they probably would have been like that's not really appropriate oh, 1998 like no but you know, nobody said anything and the judge is still my friend. So we'll, we'll just keep rolling with it. The judge loved it. <laughs> yeah. The judge loved it. The uh. judge loved it. <laughs> so I know you know a lot about like, uh, color psychology, right? Mm -hmm. What, what made you guys choose the colors that you chose for your brand? Yeah, so our brand has, um, it's mostly a maroon and a navy blue. Some of the colors are like secondary colors are pulled into these flowers behind me. Um, here's how we did it. We showed up for, I knew the photo shoot I wanted for our first brand photo shoot. And so we showed up for that photo shoot, my business partner, Kira, and myself, it was just the two of us starting out. And we showed up in our most kind of honest outfits that portrayed us, where we felt really great. And so Kira's an integrator. Uh, she's an introvert. She's very detail-oriented. I am a visionary, extrovert, creative. We're complete opposites in almost every way. And so I show up in black pleather pants and this like kind of over-the-top maroon blouse. And um, Kira shows up in a gray wool sweater and jeans and light <laughs> jeans and she showed we show up in these outfits and so we do a photo shoot and we're sitting together in this photo shoot and she's got you know light hair and our black hair and, um and we took the photos and they turned out so well and so immediately what i did to create our brand colors was actually less about psychology and more about our business is called narrow and it's all about being who you are and so we actually pulled the colors straight out of our outfits. Um, and we have this iconic sofa that was in all of our photos. Half of it is blue and plain, and that's her side. And then the other half is these floral, crazy colors, and that's my side. So we pulled all of the colors from a color picker right out of those photos, because those photos were the most honest representation of who we are. I yeah. love that. Thank I you. Love that. I've never, and I've never really worked with, um, my client in that way but i mean it makes total sense right right and it, and it does speak to like not trying to redo the box right because people it's, get so confused when it comes to photo shoots oh, it's like i'm gonna wear these things that i don't typically wear and i'm gonna put them on so i can look so great for this photo shoot but i'm never gonna wear them again and they're gonna be the wrong colors and all of the things oh right? yeah so yeah. I love that you guys did that. 
Oh, yeah, cool. we did, like, and that's where the that's where the flamingos came from. Um, one of our clients has a like a boutique, and so she actually staged the photo shoot with different props, and we ended up having so much fun with the flamingos. They became a huge part of our brand. Um, they have been ever since, and it was really a natural evolution of who are we? Let's go spend the afternoon being the most honest version of ourselves in in this photo shoot, and then see build the brand from that. Now. That's not a process that I've ever seen anyone go through before or since, um, but it is something that's worth exploring if you're starting from scratch and you, you, you have somebody with you as a photographer or creative director who is really skilled at figuring out what your marrow is and pulling that out. Yeah, and that's really that. the key. Yeah. So cool. Love Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, so let's talk about, like, you and I had already got into a bunch of disruption before we... Oh, yes. What was it that got you into this industry? You said that you worked for corporate before. Like, was there some kind of disruption that happened um, in that space where you were like, fuck this, I'm about to go and do my own thing? I think the big disruption that I'm participating in is actually uh, the decision to no longer take agency clients. So we are finishing our last agency projects right now and move exclusively into teaching. And the reason that that is so essential is, you know, whether they'll admit it or not, anybody who's spent any amount of time in agencies know that the agency model is like a little bit broken or a lot bit, a lot bit broken. Yeah. And that is not the fault of agencies. That is not the fault of clients. There are certainly occasions in which things work really well, um, but when it works really well is when you have staff in-house who are skilled, trained, and understand their responsibilities and that in, in the brand. And that is actually so rare. And so what you have is agencies on the one hand selling things to brands that brands do not understand usually what they're even buying or what they can expect for an outcome. And then the agency doesn't have the skills, time, or resources to educate them. And so you have this, this problem where the client wants this, but they don't know how to articulate it. The agency sells this. Those expectations can't be met because they're both on different pages. And then the agency ends up with scope creep and over, you know, working all these extra hours and doing all these things to try and just have a satisfied client in the end when really there was a huge, huge disconnect in the first place. And so by launching the Society of Brand Integrity in our programs like the Marketing Lab, we've always been really focused on that brand, whether it's one person or 10 people, just or 100 people, just understanding that they need the understanding in-house to either DIY their marketing or hire it appropriately, and that is not the responsibility of an agency. And that is really, that's the disruption that we're after. Oh, I love that. I actually, this is so interesting. Have you seen... Um... Emily and Paris. Emily. Okay, everybody, everybody is like, watch this and tell me what you think. I have not seen it. <laughs> okay, so they do kind of touch on that whole branding piece, right? Okay. So she works for a marketing agency. I mean, I love it because she's in Paris, and I'm just like, right. That part for me is is everything. But they talk about how one of the people that she talked to, she's like, the agency is dead, right? Mm-hmm. And it got me to thinking too, like, is the agency dead or is it the way that the agency communicates? Is that, is that the part that's dead? So maybe that's why people told you to take a look at it. And then the fact that a lot of people have influencers doing the, the, the heavy lifting for them, right? Right, right. Um, but what, what came to me in that, because one of the episodes was about influencing mm -hmm. and the influencers were molding themselves in a way that actually led to the brand, lent to the brand, but not really had them stand out, right? right. And we just finished right. talking about that, right? You yeah. got to brand yourself as yourself <laughs> and the other stuff gets to be secondary. Yes, a hundred. Oh, influencers, it's really interesting. Influencers are just the current billboard. Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's like not, not to say like not to minimize influencers, but that's what it is. It's, it's still like the medium. And I think we still do need creative professionals who can craft amazing messages, pull campaigns together, do graphics. Like all of those things are important. I don't think agencies are dead. I do think 
that we've had a mass um, flood of information that the end user can can get, and they have most most brands have just enough information to make them slightly dangerous. You know what I mean? But nobody talks about the inner workings of where things start start and end. It really like I've been in agencies for maybe two and a half years when I really stopped and and had this moment of I was talking to a client and they wanted. Uh, they called me and said they wanted a campaign. And as I spoke through this with them, I realized they didn't know what a campaign really was <laughs> compared to a brand or marketing strategy. But, and then I started thinking about how many times anybody had ever really come to me and asked for what they needed or what I would have assessed them to have needed. And that almost had never happened. So good. Like never, like, so people would come and be like, can you help with my social media? And they'd be like, but you don't have core foundational key messages for your brand, or you've never done buyer persona research, or your buyer persona research is something an agency did and they never did the research, they just made fake personas. So there were all these problems that kept coming up that I kept facing with when clients would come and ask for something. And then I would be like, I really don't think that's going to actually get them to the goal, the big goal that they're looking for. Marketing agencies should exist to help move you toward a business goal. But oftentimes they take an order and they deliver the outcome and the person who placed the order never had the context to understand what they were ordering. And so that's where we just keep getting into all these problems, right? So true. I mean, mm. I, I myself I went through that same thing I thought I needed a social media manager and one of the things that she I thought she was going to be doing was helping me with that branding piece and you should have seen some of the shit she posted for me and it was like these little animated Holly Lobby looking stuff and I'm just like you do not know me at all mm -hmm. right or mm -hmm. the person I'm trying to attract so yeah super super interesting yes. love that Thank you. <laughs> yeah, love that. Okay, so tell me more about, like, what are you teaching? And then also, I know that you're doing some interesting things on IG Reels and TikTok and all of yeah. the new stuff that's out there. So tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Society of Brand Integrity has our flagship program or signature course, the Marketing Lab. So we have, we're essentially taking the Marketing Lab and we're turning it into a year-long membership, but it was a seven-week program up until now. And so what's really cool about that is we teach you, um, somebody said to me one time, well, what if I'm too advanced for it? It's not like that it's like I said before it your brand never stops evolving right there's always another layer so um, if somebody comes into a program like ours and says like oh well you know I know everything about marketing I'm like well you're really not suited for this program then because yeah, yeah. that doesn't exist there is no everything about marketing I would learn if I could take the time and sit in the program myself right it's because it's all about guiding you through building Building a brand that is in integrity and when I say brand integrity I mean are you who you say that you are that's it and have you are you saying that you're somebody that is easy to stay consistent with so if you're showing up and you're like you know what my pizza restaurant is the fastest pizza delivery restaurant in our city you own that now it does not matter if you have the freshest tomatoes. It does not matter if you have the most delicious sauce. Nobody cares unless you're the fastest. And right. if you're not the fastest, you're now not the fastest and a liar. Literally nobody cares that you have the best tomato because you made a promise and you didn't keep it. And so everything we teach is about how do we build brand messaging that is so honest to the core, you can't go off brand. And that's really what it's all about. Ooh, love it yeah and I do I love the way that you put that together because I think a lot of people think brand integrity is not about the promise and keeping it or solving the problem and or saying that you can solve a certain problem that you really can't solve I think it's I think people believe that it's more about am I gonna show up in a certain kind of way right mm -hmm. and that's really not what it is like you have to show up in the way that you promised that you would. 
100%. Like, and that's it. And when we talk about, you know, me being on reels and me being on TikTok, I mean, why am I on those platforms? Because I dance around all the time. That's my energy. Like, I behave that way constantly. I behave that way in person. If, if we were in an office together, you, you would constantly make fun of me, as has every person that has ever worked with me, that I cannot process information without movement. So that means I doodle all day. I have a million post-its. I never look at them again, but I have to move my hand. If we get on an intense phone call, I walk up and down the hallway and yeah. I, I need movement to be able to process information. That also means constantly dancing, constantly moving around like this. So when I show up and I'm dancing on reels or I'm doing a Friday dance on our Instagram or whatever it is, that is part of our brand because it's what I do. Okay, so I gotta tell you, I love when people are doing that when it is authentic, but the ones that are killing me right now are the coaches with the... And I'm just like, what the fuck? What is this? Like, mm -hmm. nobody wants to see that. Like, this, it's not even... And then you have to do the words, right? Because they're all... <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although like, I have oh. to admit, I posted one today where um, it went a little bit off. I was like, oh. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I still do, it's so funny. I posted one the other day after, um, after the debate, actually. I was on a particular rant about whether women should smile or not smile and like do whatever you want. Exactly. You, like, can I, say, you can say fuck on here like all day long. Oh, good. Because I needed, I needed to get one out. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, right. So she was coached not to be the angry black woman, right? Yeah, yeah. And then she smiled too much was the feedback. Right. There's, right? There, look, the feedback was going to be the, the reality is, as discussed earlier, her mere presence on that stage creates discomfort in the lives of old, rich, privileged, white, straight men. So no matter what happened, there was going to be a criticism because the discomfort already was there, right? So it was more like when they say things like, oh, she smiled too much or she smiled too little, they're justifying the discomfort they already felt that is not justified. And that's really, like, in my opinion, what, what goes on. I agree. I totally agree with you on that. Right? Because so, it's like, let me be right about the fact that she should not be there. Yeah. And it's just this, like, kind of call to, like, hey, who else needs, needs an outlet for this? Who else is feeling uncomfortable and needs an excuse? Oh, here's one. Like, let, let me give you this so we can, you know, we can congregate. I mean, it's ridiculous. So clearly I needed to make a dancing TikTok about it. Um, and I, and I did the next day. I'm going to have to check it out. <laughs> well, what's funny about it is it has a typo in it. When TikTok is the worst for, uh, you can't go back and edit once you put a caption overlay, it's there. And so it has a, a typo in it and I posted it and it had started to get pretty decent engagement already. And I stopped myself. I wanted to delete it so bad. And you know, all of that, all of the commentary, all of the training that we have, don't ever let a typo get out there. Um, but you want to know the truth about my life is that I move really fast and I make, I need a proofreader all the time. I'm like, I can spell very, very well, but I want, I move too fast. And if I have to slow down and proofread my stuff, I lose my, my energy, I lose my magic. So I don't do that. So is there a misspelling mistake in it? Yeah. Also, I have two children with dysgraphia, which is a learning disability. And I know how many people out there have dyslexia or have other learning disabilities that make spelling not an easy skill for them. And so one of the things I've really tried to call myself to do lately is leave my typos up, even though I'm one of those people, um, to be able to stand in more diversity of expression, even if it looks unprofessional, because I don't feel okay with my children being in a, raised in a world where they feel like there's something wrong with them because of this learning disability. So left it but up. You make a mistake, right? Like. Who in the hell said that we can't make mistakes? Yeah. And I think that, I think this is part of the other, the and I'm not saying that there's not a level of professionalism that we all are excellent. Mm -hmm. Let me go with excellence. Mm -hmm. Excellence that we all should be um, as aspiring to. What I'm saying is that I feel like 
the the Twitter police, the the people who are checking us on all of the things, yeah, are really projecting their own uh, stuff onto us. Number one, and then number two, it's like, where did that whole idea of being perfect come from? Mm -hmm. Like that professionalism. And I, girl, I remember one time I sent an email to the judges and all their support staff, and I said. Um, what does it say? Oh, it was something about Happy Friday, and it was actually Happy Friday, or I don't know. It was a big mistake, and I was mortified because I'm like, yeah, oh God, all these judges just saw my mistake, and I'm like, you know what? They bleed just like me, and I'm sure that there's something else that they made a mistake in, and it, you know, it's really not that big of a deal. But I, I want to kind of open up the conversation about is this perfectionism part of the patriarchy or the racist patriarchy just like pounding down on us that we have to be a different way. I mean, when this all started, I'm sure, you know, who were the people who had access to proofreaders? Right? Yeah. And like, there are, you know, you'll hear stories when you're talking to people of generations behind us where like, oh yeah, like, you know, my dad or my uncle was this big executive, but he couldn't, he couldn't write or spell. So he had a secretary and that was her job. You know, the, like these things that exist, these structures that exist previously to protect that and, sh and make it look a certain way are not honest, right? Like, that's the thing. And I just don't want my, my children to believe that they need an army of people to make them look perfect if they make a spelling mistake, frankly, you know? I'm capable of not making a spelling mistake. It's a skill that I have. But I don't want the way I show up in the world. I mean, my brand also is about being who you are. Yeah. And so that means everybody and that means that sometimes you know i'm not gonna look the best and i'm okay with that trust comes down to two things openness and competence and what we have done in our society in my opinion is we have taken competence to another place that's not even reasonable and sacrificed openness so the reality is people don't expect competence in everything they need competence in something they're hiring you for something, they need confidence in something. They're hiring me for brand communications, not proofreading. They're hiring me for the soul of the message, the depth of the message. And I have, you know, some people around me that will proofread my product, but they're not hiring me to show up on social media and be perfect all the time. I'm not willing to do that at the detriment of openness. So my audience knows I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm always going to own it. I'm going to apologize. I'm definitely going to fuck up. Like, and, and I'm here for that. And I'm going to keep doing that if it means that that small business owner who is um, a cleaner or a hairdresser or whatever now has the courage maybe to make a post on social media too because it's not that big of a deal if she makes a mistake. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. This is amazing. Thank you so much. All right, oh, guys. Such so a pleasure. Natalie is one of our guest experts in the Freedom Lounge because we both love the freedom. Mm-hmm. There and She's teaching you all about the TikTok and all about IG Reels and all of the, the newer technology that's out there. So if you want to uh, be a part of that, then join our Freedom Lounge. But why don't you tell them how they can reach out to you if they heard something they wanted to do? And this is going to be in the show notes. So okay. if you have a freebie or anything that you want them to go and check out. And what's your website? What's, what's all yeah, about? our website is madeofmarrow.com. So that's made of O-F, marrow. Um, and on Instagram, we're at mademarrow. And we change our freebie all the time. So right now, I'm just looking at it. We have a, uh, we're actually inviting people to join our Facebook group on the brand and in integrity. And I go into that Facebook group every Tuesday and do a question of the week. So people send me all kinds of random marketing questions. Um, the one that I'm probably going to do next week is, you know, what should we be doing differently because of COVID with our brand communications? Um, but anything from how do I get my brand listed on Google to uh, what's working. This week I did a review of the top five social media posts that we've had this year and to show people what's still working in 2020. Um, so we do all kinds of different stuff in there, but that Facebook group is, yeah, come on in. It's completely free and it's just a place where, you know, we make sure that you're, we're building community and we're helping brands that really do care about being who they say they are. And that's what, that's what we're here to do. Woo woo.
Definitely aligned, you and I, for sure. Oh, yeah. In integrity, I might say. That's right. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much for coming today. I totally, 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 totally appreciate it. So much fun. And I know that our listeners are going to get a lot from this. So. Oh, thank you, Mia. It was such a blast. Thank you so much.